Hi, I'm John Barbosa, and I'm doing my postdoc with Sergio Nostoyec. We are interested in understanding what are the population dynamics that underlie context-dependent computations, both in auditory cortex and in artificial neural networks. A typical approach uh, to tackle these kind of questions is to train these very flexible models, RNNs, to solve the, the complex task at, of interest. And then once you have the RNN that performs the task uh, very well, you try to reverse engineer what, what was the computational solutions that this network found. For example, you can apply statistical methods that have been originally developed uh, for neuroscience and try to, to understand which latent variables are this uh, network operating with. For example, this is the dynamics of this network lives in a two-dimensional uh, uh, space, which means that this network is operating with two latent variables. Instead, we are going to uh, take a low-rank approach, which is a framework that has been developed by other people in the lab, and in particular, I'm going to constrain my network doing training to, to be of rank one, which means that this network is going to operate only with one latent variable. And by constraining the network to be like this, thanks to this, to this framework, there is an analytical mapping between the RNN and a, this set of low dimensional equations. Each equation describes one latent variable. In our case, we only have one latent variable, so we only have one equation. And this equation should look familiar to you. We have the leak term, then we have a recurrent part and an input-driven part. And you see that this is sum over p populations. So different populations might update the, the, the kappa variable with itself differently. And more importantly, different populations might integrate the input differently. And this depends on these sigmas, which are what are called the overlaps, which depends on two parts. One part, which is defined during training, during training, which is uh, this, the correlations between between uh, uh, all these these connectivity vectors, and another part which is which change dynamically and might change, for example, uh, in different contexts, which is the average gain. So, if one population has an average gain of zero during one context, that population will essentially be turned off during that context, and so the stimulus, for example, that this population is in charge of integrating, will not be integrated. This is the key mechanism of this uh, flexible integration of stimuli that we are interested in. So we train both rats and RNNs to solve context-dependent tasks. And this is a task that we study. I don't have time to go into details, but essentially there are two sets of stimuli that are always present, and, the, and both the animals and the task has to ignore one of the stimulus and integrate the other, depending on which the context they are. So now we can go in and try to understand what are the computations that this network performed to solve the task. And in particular, the overlaps are very revealing. There's a lot to be said about this, but I'm going to focus here on, on, on two facts. The first fact is that we, find out, we found out that there, you need three populations to solve this task. And two of them, the ones I'm going to focus now, are gain modulated depending on the context. So one population, which is as a strong overlap with stimulus B, which means that this population will integrate stimulus B, this population has a high gain during context B. However, during context A, this population has essentially gained zero, which means it will be turned off during context A. So during context A, there will be no integration of stimulus B because that population is, has a gain of zero, and vice versa for the other population. We can also take a look at that the, all the network activity projected on different uh, axes. For example, if you project on the output axis, we see that the network groups different trials based on the decision which it trained upon at the end of the trial. However, there are other projections where you can decode the stimulus perfectly, regardless of, of the context, even the stimulus that should be ignored. So let's rearrange this um, in, a, in a 3D plot and in particular, I'm going to look at the activity during the stimulus to so only one time point and project it on each of these axes. So this is a picture that emerges. So we can see that during, during each context, you can decode perfectly all the, all the task variables, decision, stimulus A or stimulus B. However, more interestingly, we can go and try to see what's going on in each of these populations that we, we found out. Here is all of them together. And in particular, I'm going to focus on these populations that are game modulated. So this population, population B, we showed you before, has a high gain during context B. And so we're going to call this population the population with a high gain in B. And this, high gain, this gain is going to be computed during the pre-stimulus. But we're going to look at the activity during the stimulus. 
and we see again this gain modulation picture. So, however, we select these populations based on the pre-stimulus gain. During the stimulus, there is this gain modulation that clearly favors one context or the other, depending on the population. We can also compute, quantify this gain modulation by compute the distance between the go trials and the no-go trials on each of these cases. We see there is no difference when you look at all the network together, but if you look at these uh, populations, we see that there is a, a clear uh, gain modulation uh, for each of these contexts and populations. I'm very excited to tell you that in A1 we found very similar uh, dynamics. However, I, I don't have time to go into the details here, and I invite you to come to the poster so we can discuss all the details with you.